All right. As you just saw on our screen, we're continuing our series with life in 3D. Things that fly out at you. Now, how many of you guys have ever been to a, a 3D movie where you uh, were watching it for a while and give you a little bit of a headache? Raise your hand if you were like that. You know, that's a weird phenomenon, but that happens. Well, you know, in life, when things pop out at you, sometimes it gives you a little bit of a headache. Sometimes it's a little bit of a pain, and you have to watch it, and you're like, oh, I don't like this. Now, if that's you when you're watching a 3D movie in life, when discouragement flies at you, it also can give you a little bit of a headache. So what I want to do is, is I want to talk to you today about things that fly out at you. Last week we covered disappointment and how disappointment pops right out of the screen and gets right in your face. Well, there's another disappointment that we're going to be talking, or a D word that we're going to be talking about today, and that's that discouragement and how we can be discouraged in this life. And if you want to know what the word discouragement means, I'm going to explain that to you in great detail. But I want to take a moment and read you a couple of verses that are our verses for this entire series. And that's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And it says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Now here's one of those verses everybody gets all excited about until disappointment and discourage pops out at you. And then you're like, I thought everything was going to work out for the good. I thought everything was going to be great. It's going to work out all perfectly. Well, here's the thing. That scripture is very true. Here's the problem. You take a rock and you throw it in the water, it causes ripples. What happens is we are in the center where that rock hit. And all we see is the surrounding effects. We don't see the ripple that it caused. So you might have walked through something horrible in your life, but trust me when I say God is going to take that thing and use it for His glory. You say, well, that's horrible. I don't want to go through bad things. Me neither. But that is also called life. I love going to the movies and watching a movie that people are like real uh, jumpy. You guys ever watch the movie with somebody who's super jumpy? You're like sitting next to them and they're like, ah! <laughs> and they get all, woo! And they just jump every 10 seconds. I love watching that. It's hilarious. And uh, that's great. It's, to me, that's even more fun than watching the movie. I just sit back and go, look at him jump. That's great. Woo! -hoo -hoo! Hands on up. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, in life, sometimes discouragement pops out at you and you get scared like that. But Jesus gave us a great word of encouragement, and this is found in John chapter 14, verse 1. It says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Once again, man, he is just like, don't let your hearts be troubled. So what I want to do today is I want to define what discouragement is, and then I'm going to give you four biblical uh, uh, men who fought against discouragement. And what I want to do is I want to show you how, where discouragement came from in their life and how they dealt with that discouragement. Is that okay with you? Well, too bad. It's my pulpit if you didn't like it. All right. <laughs> All right. Number one, when discouragement pops out at you. You know, I mean, that's one of the coolest things about watching a 3D movie is seeing that thing pop out of the screen. Like I talked about last week with that, someone throws a spear, and that spear goes, Vroom. you're like, oh, that's cool. I talked about last week how I first showed my son Judah, Lava Girl and, or Lava Boy and Shark Girl. No, Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And as you can tell, I really liked the movie. And um, <laughs> anyways, seeing those pop-out effects, Judah just kind of reaching out and trying to grab them. You know, that's one of the fun things about a 3D movie. Well, in life, when disappointment and discouragement pop out at you, it's not necessarily a fun thing. But what does the word discouragement mean? It means deprived of courage or confidence. Deprived of courage or confidence. I love the word that was given, both words that were given this morning. The interpretation was right on with what I'm preaching on today. And the word of encouragement was right for those who are needing some encouragement today. So both words were just on, on par today. You know, discouragement, disappointment, they are emotions that we all face. Even these great men in the Bible who were like, wow, there's no way this man of God faced this. I'm going to show you that they did today. 
Discouragement, once again, is that lack or the deprived of courage or confidence. You know, there's danger, though, if we allow that emotion to get us. There's a danger if we let discouragement linger in our hearts. You know, when we let it linger in our hearts, it can be costly. It can not only take up a lot of time where it doesn't need to, but it also weakens our faith. When we allow dis- disappointment to discourage us, then it causes something else, which we will talk about next week. And uh, dun, dun, dun. that's called creating tension. I'm just t- talking to the uh, preachers there. All right. You know what? Uh, discouragement can also affect others around us. Do you guys remember the old term, Debbie Downers? Isn't it like we have an entire culture of Debbie Downers now? Ah, oh, I'm a victim, and now because I'm a victim, I can speak into this. Well, I'm not a victim, and I can still speak into that. Good job. You know, like, oh, no, you can't because you didn't walk through this. Well, where's that written at? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. You can't shut a door because you never had the door shut on you. Well, yes, I can. I can walk over there and shut that door. You know, it's it's one of those things in our culture that we have found that everybody wants to have be a victim. Always, oh, because this happened to me, I can say this. Well, yeah, no, that's not how it works. You know, it's one of those things in our culture, we, we can affect each other. You know, if you've ever been around somebody who is a Debbie Downer, you notice that depression and that, that discouragement, it starts rubbing off on you. So, you know, a good way to fight that, and I'll get into those in a little bit, is to light yourself on fire and see their log burn. (laughs) Spiritually speaking, of course. Let me give you guys four examples in the Bible. Four examples of people who have faced discouragement. Now, when you think about discouragement, who's the first biblical character that pops out at you? Job. Job, right? I mean, everybody knows that Job went through some horrid, just horrible things. Job, I mean, his family, I mean, all these people died. His everything, his livelihood is gone. His body, his health is gone. He got nothing left. And let me, how many guys have ever seen those? um, (laughs) It's a little dated now, but those old emo uh, uh, poet places where they go up there and they walk up on stage and they're like, All right, well, that's what Job did, right? He walked out on stage and he said, may the day of my birth perish, perish. You know, and he went on and he said, and the night it was said, a boy is born, and that day may turn into darkness, (laughs) darkness. But that's what Job did here. He just explained all these horrible things that he had to walk through. And he said, may God above not care about it. This is Job 3, verse 3 through 8. You know, it's amazing. let Let me read you the rest of it. It's just crazy how his heart was so dismayed. He said, may no light shine upon it. May darkness and deep shadow, may darkness and deep shadow claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm its light. That night may thick darkness seize it. May it not include, um, be included among the days of the year, nor be entered into any of the mouths. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. He's talking about his birthday. That that day itself may be cursed. The dark shadow may seize it. <laughs> Job faced discouragement. Let me show you somebody else in the Bible who also faced discouragement. He is one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. His name is Elijah. Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 35 says this. This was after a great victory. You guys all know the story most likely of the the story of him on Mount Carmel. And if you don't, let me explain it real quick. He goes before all the prophets of Baal. And he says, all right, we're going to have two altars here. And we're going to ask God to consume the altar, to burn it up. If your God, Baal, answers by fire and he consumes up your altar, 
Cool, we'll worship him. But if God of the Israelites, if he uh, answers by fire, then he is God. So he stood before all the hundreds of prophets of Baal, and he stood before them, and he said, you go first since there's so many. I'm just one. You got a whole bunch of you. And they're slashing, they're yelling and screaming, oh, Baal, answer by fire. Only thing that flowed that day was their blood because they kept doing it. And here's the thing. Nothing happened. But Elijah, who walks up there and says, let them know that there is God in Israel. And boom, God consumes the fire in front of everybody. And in his mind, man, it's going to be revival now. Everybody's going to rejoice. The Israelites said, yeah, we're going to do this. And they slaughtered those false prophets. And, you know, he's thinking, man, he's on top of the world. Revival just hit. And this was his response. We're going to talk about why in a moment, though. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Why he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came into a broom tree. He sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then, they lay, then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. What happened? Why was he so dismayed? Here he had this great victory. Awesome. We were thousands of years later. We're still talking about it. But yet right after that, he goes under the tree in the desert. He's like, forget this, God. Kill me. I don't want to live anymore. I'm done. Let's talk about another prophet who struggled with this. This, of course, is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 14. It says this, I became a laughingstock of all my people. They mocked me in song all day long. He, was, he has filled me with bitter herbs and salted me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel and he has uh, trampled me into the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering in the bitterness and the gall. I remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Great prophet Jeremiah, man of God, powerful. We still talk about his exploits that God used him in to this day. Why was he so downcast? Why was he so depressed? Why was life so meaningless? Another person that faced discouragement to illustrate it, to compare, to give a comparison. That's for our preacher class people. Is Peter. Chapter uh, 26 of Matthew, verse 75. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. Here's the part that you need to see. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Why was he so discouraged? Why was he weeping so much? Why were all these great men of God, why were they in the midst of the horrible things going on? Why did they have such hearts that were so downcast? They struggled so much. Once again, discouragement is deprived of courage or confidence. And if you linger in discouragement, it is costly. And when you face it, and when it pops out at it, you... It's sometimes that feels like all you can see is that what just popped out of the screen in your face. Just like those 3D movies when those things pop out. But if you ever pause and get your focus off of what's right in front of you, and you look to the side, you'll notice that it goes into the screen and has a depth to it. That it's more than what you just perceive right before you. But there's something that's causing it. There's a reason why they were dismayed. There's a reason why they were discouraged. And I want to point out those to you today and give you four reasons why they were discouraged. And because those four reasons why these men of God were discouraged are the same reasons we face discouragement today. And that first one I want to talk about, of course, is Job. 
Why did Job face discouragement? Well, obviously, he had multiple things that caused discouragement. His entire life, you could say, was the word discouragement. But there was something that happened in Job that is written down for us to study through the ages. And this is how his wife and friends treated Job. His wife was like, curse God and die. Thanks, honey. I'm very encouraged now. (laughs) You really lifted my burden. I appreciate it. And his friends, instead of going, hey, bud, it's going to be all right. You're going to get through this. You can do this, man. We believe in you. Keep going. Was like, surely you sinned. Surely you did what was wrong. God's just. You're not. You're a sinner. Thank you, friends. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm so encouraged in my heart now. Or what did he say? Well, let's take a look on how he responded to his friends. Job 26, verse 1 through 6. When I'm reading this, uh, the sarcasm is not implied. It is there. So I want you to see this. All right? It says this. Then Job replied, How have you helped the powerless? How have you saved the arm that is feeble? What advice you have offered the one who is without wisdom? And what great insight have you displayed? Who has helped you utter these words? And whose spirit spoke from your mouth? The dead are in deep anguish. Those beneath the waters, all that live in them. Death is naked before God and destruction lies uncovered. My first thing that happens in life is shown here in Job. Job felt discouragement because of his wife and friends. Sometimes people around us are going to discourage you. Sometimes people are going to just pull you down in life. Maybe it's at your workplace and it's constant negativity. Maybe it's here at church. Somebody might look at you cross. In their mind, they'll be like, ooh, pizza, not sitting good. And you might be thinking, oh, they hate my guts. Okay, who knows? But in life, people are going to try and discourage you. The very people that should have loved on Job and have brought him encouragement said, curse God and die. I, I love Job's sarcasm. He's like, oh, that you have enlightened, you know. You know I mean, it's like amazing. But Job felt it. He felt that discouragement. I want to read a little bit more of the story there about Elijah to see the depth of his discouragement, where it came from. So here it says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 19 in 1 Kings, we're going to expand the story now a little bit. And it says this, Now Ahab, this is right after Mount Carmel, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah say, to say, May the gods deal with me, be ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, like I had read of his discouragement, They said, God, I'm done. I'm fed up. Man, we just had this awesome event happen. And now Queen Jezebel is kind of come kill me. Man, I thought it was going to be revival. I thought if I stood before them and your fire came down, the nation would repent. They'd outthrow that that evil lady and it would be a revival on the land. It would be just great. My expectation was this. My disappointment is here. And now, because you didn't do as I thought you should have, I am in dismay. You see how last week's disappointment is fulfilled in today's discouragement? Did you catch that? Do you see how your former disappointments is the bedrock, the foundation for today's present discouragement? Here's the thing. Elijah was like, God, just kill me. Done. Fed up. That was the depth of his discouragement. Elijah became discouraged with his life's circumstance. His circumstances just became, you know, unbearable because he thought this and this happened. So he became discouraged. Now let's pop down to Jeremiah. Lamentations 3, verse 1 through 6. Once again, 
obviously very poetic in the way he states things. He says, I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has beseeched me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Who is he in this story? It is God. Jeremiah felt anger and discouragement towards God. You know, sometimes in life, with our disappointments, we allow them to turn to discouragement in our hearts. Jeremiah was very discouraged and angry at this point. His depth of disappointment was not necessarily just the rejection of Israel, of his land, Judah, around him, but his anger was towards God as he made him walk in darkness. Sometimes we're discouraged by God. Why have you let this happen? Why? All we see is the first ring of the ripple. Why? I don't see in that ring how it's going to affect anything good. Jeremiah walked in discouragement with God. What about Peter? Where was Peter's discouragement from? You can read the whole story in Matthew 26, verse 1 through 75. It's an amazing story on how Christ is arrested. And he stands before Christ and he says, three times you're going to deny me by the time the rooster crows. What was Peter's response? No way! Everybody else is going to fall away. Not me. I got my sword and they got ears and I'm cutting them. You know what I mean? He is ready. He's excited to attack. He's like, no way. Everybody else is going to fall away. There is no way this guy will. And we read his discouragement in the first point. His discouragement was in himself. Peter was discouraged by his own actions. That he didn't stand up for Christ. Even to a little slave girl, he denied Christ. And in realizing it, he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter felt discouraged with himself. Let's be honest, in life, we too can get discouraged with ourselves. You know, I was... Uh, uh, I, I love the Rocky movies, and I love the whole, uh, you know, the, the, the drama of the uh, old, old fight scene, and I remember all the old fight stuff, and even on the way to church this morning, I was uh, thinking about, you know, uh, watching Sylvester Stallone box again and doing all these things, and remember the, hey, John, you know, and just the whole fight scene, and, and uh, it started stirring in me where I wanted to put the gloves on again and, and to do some of that, and I was like, oh, I want to spar again, oh, you know, and I started, and I realized, uh-oh. I started to crave it, almost like it was a lust. I thought, oh, man. So I had to take that thought captive. And I had to stop. You know what? I bring that up because we need to view discouragement through 3D glasses, through God's perspective. Now, once again, I, I covered this last week, but if you were here last week, you're not going to remember this. So I want to cover it one more time. How many guys have ever been in a 3D or 3D? movie theater, and they have, uh, you've taken off the glasses, and you've looked at the screen. It is weird, right? It's like two images have been ghosted over each other, and if you take off the glasses, you lose complete perspective of the 3D image. Well, you know what? If we take off our God goggles, we lose perspective of what's before us. We start focusing on the distortion instead of what it is. And you know that, that I want to give you five things. I'm going to give you five things to be able to take home today, to be able to say, you know what? When next time discouragement comes at me and it pops out at the screen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to view it through my God goggles. I'm going to view it through my God perspective, and it's going to change it. It's going to change the way that black cloud covers me. First of all, it's going to sound real simple on this first one, but it is simple. Be honest. 
First of all, be honest. I mean, I look at Job's life, and he was brutally honest. You know, here in uh, Job 23, verse 16, he says this, God has discouraged me. The Almighty has filled me with terror. He was honest. He's like, yeah, man, I'm discouraged. He wasn't, he wasn't going, oh, I'm all discouraged. Yeah, I'm happy. Life is grand. You know, putting on a show, putting on a mask, a persona. If you're discouraged, own it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm discouraged. But then don't linger in it. Why do we become a victim and stay in that victimhood? I've been victimized. This is now my identity. Oh, baloney. That is no my identity. That is my past. My future is awesome. And I'm going to show you it, it here in Job's life that it was not that he stayed the victim. Job's story is not about victimhood. It changed. And I'm going to read you two verses to show this. Job 42, verse 1 through 3 says this, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is it that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. That's Job saying, I am only seeing the ripple. But God, you're seeing the ripple's effect. I am nothing but a man. In the midst of my sorrow, I have humbled myself. And I will view things with an internal perspective. I'm going to see that God is going to be honored in my life, no matter what my circumstance is. Now let me move on to Job 42, verse 12. The Lord blessed Listen to this. The Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the first. So what happened in the story of Job? We see a man who was faithful to God, that he was stripped of everything, that his life was a living discouragement. And in the midst of that discouragement, he owned it. He said, yeah, I'm discouraged now. Yeah, but I'm not going to curse God and die. I'm not going to say that I sinned when I didn't. I'm going to press in. I'm going to keep pushing through. And when he got to the point where he humbled himself before God and said, God, your ways are awesome. Your plans cannot be toward it I am standing on you and when he did that God blessed him and restored his life Amen. and his later years were more blessed than his former Here's the thing, when life happens, when discouragement pops out at you, that's the roadblock you think, but it's a speed bump to go over and press through. Be honest and do it. Here's the thing, discouragement is a fight. You have to fight it. I got to breathe a little. All right, let's move on. Elijah. No, I'm good, thank you. Let's move on to Elijah now. I'm going to add a few more verses. Let's add a few more verses. Once again, he said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. Here's how it changed for him. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Hebron, Horeb, and the mountain of God. My next point is this. Take care of your body. What was the first thing in the midst of his depression and discouragement that he was walking through that the Lord did for him? Did it give him some great theological understanding? Nope. Did he do all these uh, miracles, amazing things to encourage him? Nope. You know what he did? He gave him angel food cake. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it said he baked a cake of bread from an angel, angel food cake bread. And uh, anyways, I'm just saying, that is scripturally sound. <laughs> Amen. 
But he took care of his body. Let me tell you, if your body's out of whack, it knocks your, the rest of you out of whack. Your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, it knocks them out of whack. Can I say a couple things? And uh, I know we're running a little long here. I'm almost done. Uh, a couple things. When I was a youth pastor and kids would come to me uh, when they were all depressed. Now, this was a few years back when they used to do the little cutting thing. And not the ones where they were committing suicide, but they just cut themselves to make them feel, feel better. And here's one of the things that I would tell them. I said, when you do that, they say, it makes me feel better. And that's because it relieved a weird endorphin because of the adrenaline rush. So it released a weird endorphin, and they thought it made them feel better. So here's the thing. is I told them, instead of doing that, just simply get up. Next time you're tempted to do that, get up and do jumping jacks until you're breathing heavy and you're sweating on your brow and then sit down and tell me how you feel uh, you wouldn't believe how many kids come back and say, pastor john it works i'm like duh because you're releasing endorphins again i didn't say the duh part but i, I really did think it and uh <laughs> but it's because that release of endorphins does your body good get up and move another thing is in our climate we don't get a lot of sun we do not get a lot of vitamin d in our sun so take vitamins you know, I take a men's one a day, especially because I'm over 40, you know. <laughs> so. How rude. And uh, <laughs> Take care of your body, guys. You wouldn't believe how much better it will make you feel. All right. Next one is this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that has set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. This morning driving here, I realized that it was stirring some aggression in my heart, and I thought, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. Uh-uh. I had to take that thought captive. And then I thought of something chocolatey. <laughs> Actually, I think I had a drink of coffee. <laughs> Here's the thing. The next step is pay attention to your thought life. What are you dreaming about in your thought life? What are you dreaming about others in your thought life? They hurt me. They did this. They did that. Stop it. You're reliving a pain over and over again. Choose to forgive and move on. That is not who you are. I am a new creation in Christ. That is my past. That is not my present. That is not my future. That is what has happened to me. That is gone. Push past it. Take control of your brain it's hard it's not easy but when you do philippians 4 8 says this finally brothers whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things think about good stuff quit living in those things of the past they hurt don't live in the past. Live in what the promises of God are for you. Push through. You can do it. I want to show you how Jeremiah did it. Okay? This is really cool. This is uh, him talking about these horrible things. And then there's a stop after the point where we have read. And I want to read the next portion after we've read. It's really cool. Lamentations 3, 18 through 22, the first part we've read, which he said, So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them and my soul is downcast within me. That's where we stopped. And here's the next portion. He says this, Yet this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. 
Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassion never fails. In the midst of His discouragement, He said, Nope, I'm going to bring to mind the hope that I have in the Lord. Nope, His love endures forever. His compassion never fails. So in the midst of my problems, in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of discouragement, I stop. And I take every thought captive. The thing that wants to consume my thought, my brain pan. I go, "Uh uh-uh. Not in this house. Not in this house. Pause. Stop. Recalibrate it and keep pressing forward. Keeping your eyes fixated on Christ. Which is my next point. Train yourself to see Life out of the two lenses. Now, how many guys have ever, I know I'm going long, sorry. It's just the way it is. And uh, so, how many guys have ever seen those uh, uh, 3D glasses, you put them on, and have you ever looked at the other person sitting next to you and never closed one eye? Yeah, next time you're in a movie theater, close one eye and look at the person next to you. And when you notice, you're going to notice one lens is dark and one lens is still see-through. Swap eyes, then close the other eye. And you're going to notice the lenses switch because they're called polarized lenses and only allow certain types of light to come through. So when you're looking at the screen, that's what makes it so you can have that 3D effect. So next time you wear 3D glasses on, look at the person next to you. Now, you can't have, uh, you have to be in the movie theater, the passive 3D, and you're close one eye and you're going to notice one's dark and the other one's light and you switch eyes and you're going to notice it switches. Well, here's the thing. Too many times we walk around with one eye. This is our life. I'm going to keep it closed because I can see that 2D image now. I can see it clear as today. I can see everything about it. Except it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. When I view things in the temporal only, the things of the here and now only, I lose perspective. I lose the design of the image. When I look through both lenses and I keep my eyes fixated on the eternal I now see the image clearly the way it was designed to be seen. You might be going, well, where, where is this? Show me some scripture on this. Okay, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 18. It says this, hard pressed on every side, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, and yet did not become crushed, despairing, abandoned, or destroyed. Why? He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. So when you start viewing things with an eternal perspective, seeing life, yeah, I'm not denying it. Life happens. But now I see things from an eternal perspective. It changes everything. And I close with this verse. This was our verse for today. Jesus said, John 14, verse 1. He said this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. How do you not let your heart be troubled? By doing what I just told you to do on each one of those points. And he says this, Trust in God. Trust also in me. Here's your last thing I want to encourage you with to break discouragement. And that is simply press into God. We, by nature, are pursuers. We're hunters. We will pursue something. We will either pursue our own desires in the temporal matters of this world, or we will pursue the eternal matters, and we will pursue God. And we will seek His kingdom first. And in that, I want to encourage you with this. And I'm going to close. Discouragement is deprived of courage and confidence. And if we linger in it, there's cost to it. Job felt discouraged by his wife and friends. We get discouraged by those around us sometimes. Elijah became discouraged with life circumstances like we do. Jeremiah even felt anger and frustration and discouragement towards God. Peter was discouraged by himself. Every one of those discouragements happened to you and I. And in order to overcome discouragement, I want us to see things with our 3D glasses on. 
In order to overcome discouragement, we must be honest with ourselves and honest with God. We must take care of our body. We must pay attention to our thought life. We must train ourselves to see out of both lenses at the same time. And we need to press into God, trusting wholly that he knows the ripple effect, that it's beyond our understanding. Would you please stand?